Right guys, welcome to Psychopathology Lesson 1. Over the next 15-20 minutes or so, we're going to be breaking down the four main definitions of abnormality outlined in the AQA spec. I'm going to outline and evaluate each definition in turn, but you can of course use the chapters in the description below to navigate to somewhere specific in the video if you want to. If you're looking for some model answers to exam questions, they will also be linked in the description as and when I have some videos to share with you. Finally, if you find this video useful, a like would be amazing. Thank you in advance, and let's get started. Now just to start off, psychopathology is the study of psychological disorders. And so one of the first things that we have to do is determine how to decide whether a person's behavior or psychological state, or both, are sufficiently unusual to justify a diagnosis and treatment. The four definitions on the screen now all provide their own answer to that question. As with a lot of things in psychology, none of them are perfect, as you will find out over the course of this video, and none of them will work all of the time in all situations. But the definitions at least give us a starting point. Okay, so let's jump straight in with the first one. So our first definition is statistical infrequency. And statistical infrequency determines abnormality by how rare specific characteristics are within a given population. So as an example, schizophrenia only affects 1% of the population and therefore is statistically infrequent and abnormal. The frequency of a trait is established using a normal distribution curve, where the majority of the population falls within the middle range for any characteristic and only a small percentage fall at the extreme ends. Abnormality therefore is determined by how far an individual's behavior deviates from the statistical norm. Okay, so let's have a look at that in an example. So let's take IQ. The average IQ in the general population is set at around 100, with the majority of people scoring between 85 and 115, which is the middle of the curve. As you see on the screen now, 68% lie within that middle range. As you move more to the extreme ends of the curve though, you get a smaller frequency of that trait. So only around 2-2.5% of people have an IQ of below 70, which makes it statistically infrequent, and potentially an indication of some form of intellectual disability. And on the other hand, an IQ score of above 130 is also statistically infrequent, because only around 2-2.5% of the population would score that highly. Okay? So that is your first definition done and dusted. Remember, you always need a quick description of what it is and then an example just to kind of add in the detail. We're now going to have a look at the first two evaluation points and have a look at some of the pros and cons associated with this definition. So a key strength of statistical infrequency is its practical application in clinical assessment and diagnosis. For example, a high score on Beck's depression inventory, which is a very well-known and widely used depression questionnaire, such as 30 or above, is statistically infrequent compared to the general population and indicates severe depression. Equally, an IQ of below 70 is required for a diagnosis of intellectual disability disorder. Okay, so in both of these cases, statistical infrequency is very, very useful on the one hand for diagnosing something and on the other hand for assessing something. Okay, now using quantifiable and objective data in this way allows professionals to clearly identify behaviors that deviate from the statistical norm and it helps to maintain consistency and reliability in diagnosis procedures, which in turn facilitates the development of appropriate treatment plans for people who need them. Okay, so that is a really, really big strength of this definition. However, a weakness of statistical infrequency is that it does not distinguish between desirable and undesirable rare traits, and it assumes that all statistically rare characteristics are negative or problematic. However, some unusual traits can be positive. So, for example, having an exceptionally high level of IQ or an exceptionally high level of creativity is statistically infrequent, but is generally seen as advantageous rather than problematic. 
And that suggests that statistical infrequency doesn't consider the value and the context of rare traits, and therefore this definition should not be used in isolation to determine abnormality. Okay, and that is a limitation of this definition. Now, obviously, I've just given you the shortened version of that evaluation point, but please keep in mind that when you write these points in an essay or in an exam in general, you're going to need to structure them in a peel paragraph. Okay, so for anyone who's looking for an example of what that would look like, it's going to be something like this. Now, don't panic if you haven't had much experience with formulating peel paragraphs in psych. It takes practice, but it will come with time. Make sure you build some regular written evaluation practice into your revision and make sure you get regular feedback from teachers or peers or whoever looks over your work. You can, of course, use my exam and essay videos as well to compare what you're writing with what I've written. OK, but just one way or another, make sure you're practicing and make sure you are getting feedback. So our second definition of abnormality is deviation from social norms. Now, social norms are unwritten rules, expectations and standards that are set by a society and a culture that determine what is considered acceptable behavior. Deviation from social norms as a definition considers behavior abnormal if it significantly violates these social norms. Now, as part of this definition, it's really important to understand and appreciate that social norms are specific to culture and to time period, and therefore they are not a static thing over time or by location. Okay, so wherever you are in the world and whenever you are in the world, behaviors and traits are potentially going to be considered normal that might not be considered normal somewhere else. Now, obviously, there are loads of examples of people doing things that go against social norms. However, a clinical example that comes up again further down the line in the course is antisocial personality disorder, or ASPD. Now, a person with ASPD displays persistent patterns of disregard for others' rights and societal rules, and people with ASPD often engage in deceitful, manipulative, or aggressive behavior. They often break the law without experiencing any empathy or remorse for their actions. And therefore, people with ASPD do not conform to the expected societal standards, such as empathy, accountability, and mutual respect, which we expect other people in our society to conform to. And that means that they deviate from social norms and would be considered abnormal. Okay, and that brings us to the end of definition number two, and now we're going to have a look at two evaluation points. Now, as with statistical infrequency, a strength of deviation from social norms is its practical use in the diagnosing of abnormal behavior. So, for example, as mentioned earlier, individuals with ASPD exhibit behaviors such as chronic deceit, aggression, and a lack of empathy, which clearly violate social norms and can be identified by professionals. In addition, when diagnosing conditions such as schizotypal personality disorder, professionals often use terms like odd and eccentric to describe people's thinking, people's appearance, and behavior. Okay, and obviously, odd and eccentric, they are terms that are very much defined by what is considered normal in a society. Odd and eccentric isn't something that can be quantified or measured like in statistical infrequency. Okay, and therefore, being able to identify behaviors that violate social norms in this way enables professionals to make diagnoses and ensure that individuals receive appropriate treatment and support. However, on the other hand, a significant limitation of deviation from social norms is its lack of universality. Okay, and that is because what is considered abnormal can vary greatly across different cultures. So, for example, in some Western cultures, hearing voices is typically considered a symptom of severe mental disorder, like schizophrenia, which deviates from social norms. However, in other cultures, hearing voices might be regarded as a normal experience associated with spiritual or religious practices. 
and this level of variability can potentially lead to misdiagnosis and inappropriate treatment as well as the misunderstanding of cultural practices if clinicians do not take cultural context into account. It also means that deviation from social norms cannot be applied equally as a definition for abnormality across all cultures and contexts because what is considered normal in every culture and context is different. And that is a limitation of the definition. Okay, and for anyone who wants to see what it would look like in appeal paragraph, here is one of those two evaluations written out in full. Okay. So moving on, our third definition of abnormality is failure to function adequately. And this definition suggests that people are abnormal if they can no longer cope with the demands of everyday life. Now, general indications that somebody may not be coping could be an inability to maintain work or relationships or an inability to look after yourself. Rosenhan and Seligman suggest some additional signs of failing to function, which include not conforming to standard interpersonal rules, experiencing severe personal distress or being distressing to others, and being irrational and or a danger to yourself or others. It's also important to note that failure to function adequately is often used together with other definitions of abnormality in order to provide a diagnosis. So, for example, intellectual disability disorder would not be diagnosed using statistical infrequency alone. Failure to function adequately would be used in addition before providing somebody with a diagnosis. So take, for example, a person suffering from severe depression. They might find it impossible to get out of bed and they may be suffering from hypersomnia. They may also not feel like showering or eating and that may then lead to strained relationships or a dip in performance at work, which could result in the loss of one or both of those things. So this level of dysfunction indicates abnormality because it significantly disrupts everyday living and well-being, which is an indication of failing to function adequately. So let's have a look at two evaluation points for this definition. So firstly, a key strength of this definition is that it provides a sensible threshold for determining when an individual needs help. When they are unable to perform essential daily activities and fulfill basic responsibilities, it clearly indicates a significant level of distress or impairment and signals the need for professional intervention. So that means that we have a practical criterion which ensures that help is provided when an individual's ability to live a normal life is compromised, which then allows professionals to prioritize those people who are most in need. On the other hand, as a limitation, we have to appreciate that not being able to cope with the demands of everyday life can be normal in certain circumstances. So, for example, if somebody has experienced a significant negative life event, such as a relationship breakdown or a bereavement, it would be completely understandable if they were experiencing some distress or were perhaps not maintaining basic levels of nutrition or hygiene. And that is something that the definition doesn't account for context. Now, a small counterpoint here is that failing to function due to an understandable situation doesn't take away from the fact that somebody is not coping and may need help. However, it does mean that when you're using this definition, it's very important to consider severity and duration of symptoms as well as the context before labeling somebody as abnormal. OK, and that's what this definition fails to do. Consider the context and that is a limitation of failure to function adequately. Right. And finally, our last definition of abnormality is deviation from ideal mental health. Now, this definition was proposed by Marie Jehoda in 1958 and it compares an individual's psychological state against a set of criteria for optimal mental health. 
So Jehoda actually takes a slightly different approach to all the other definitions because she first determines what makes a person psychologically healthy and has created a set of characteristics that is considered ideal mental health and then she compares a person's psychological state to that list. So Jehoda identified eight key criteria of ideal mental health, which you can see appearing on your screen now. According to the definition, if somebody struggles to meet these criteria, they may be seen as deviating from ideal mental health. Okay, so for example, somebody with chronic anxiety may struggle with stress and lack autonomy. Their anxiety may also stop them successfully enjoying their leisure and being relationships. And so according to Jehoda's criteria, they would be considered to have deviated from ideal mental health and would therefore be considered abnormal. Okay, and then one final time, let's have a look at two evaluation points. Now, a significant strength of the deviation from ideal mental health definition is that it creates a clear and comprehensive benchmark for mental health. So the fact that Jehoda has outlined specific criteria means that we have a structured framework for assessing an individual psychological state. That then helps clinicians to systematically evaluate various aspects of psychological functioning, which ensures a thorough and balanced assessment. What's also really nice about this definition is that it's useful in identifying specific areas where intervention is needed, which means that we can then target and facilitate effective treatment plans for those specific areas. So for example, if somebody is struggling with self-actualization, then you might send them to see a humanistic therapist. Whereas if somebody is struggling to deal with stress, you might prescribe them some anti-stress medication or, you know, take your pick, anything from the list, but it means that you can target the criteria individually with different professionals. Okay, therefore, deviation from ideal mental health enhances the precision and effectiveness of clinical assessments and interventions, ensuring that people are given the help that they need to cope with the demands of everyday life. However, a limitation of the definition is culture bias. Now, this definition is based on criteria that reflect Western ideals of psychological well-being, such as autonomy, self-actualization, and individualism. And Jehoda very much puts these criteria out there as being ideal mental health, regardless of where you are in the world. However, different cultures may have different beliefs surrounding the importance of the concepts on Jehoda's list. So for example, in collectivist cultures, the emphasis is on community and interdependence and social harmony rather than individual achievement and independence. And that could lead to the inappropriate diagnosis of individuals from non-Western backgrounds. And therefore, while the definition does try to provide a comprehensive view of psychological well-being, the fact that it focuses on Western values limits its applicability across diverse populations. So just to finish up, you've now had four definitions of abnormality and you've had two evaluation points for each. There's been a lot of information in this video and so it's going to be really important for you to go back over them and just make sure that you've understood everything. You can see them on your screen now very briefly summed up with the two evaluation points as well. You might have realized that the strength in all of these is that they are useful in diagnosis. Okay, so technically you only have one strength to learn. However, the reason why they're useful in diagnosis kind of varies between them. Okay, so you still have to kind of understand why they're useful, but overall they are all useful in diagnosis in their own way. Okay, the limitations vary between them, but you know, the pros at least are all fairly similar. Okay, so take some time, go back over the content and make sure you understand it all so that if it comes up in an exam, you'll be ready for it. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the video.
I hope it's all made sense and I hope it's been useful. It's slightly longer than a normal video, but we have had a lot to cover. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.